Welcome to the second installment of HipMojo, show number 11. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about whether or not marketers and advertisers should be publishers and basically be in the content business. What do you think? Um, you know, it, it's funny because for the last two, three years, um, pretty much every social media douchebag and, and major content marketer has been saying just this. Uh, marketers and advertisers have to become publishers. And, there, and there's pretty much two reasons. One, you actually got to get the audience's attention. Like, who looks at display ads anymore? Uh, you, you want to get those eyeballs. Uh, two, it's it's more, okay, so there's three reasons. Two, it's more interactive. They actually engage with the content. It's great if they notice a banner, but they don't, it, it doesn't necessarily change their perceptions. But three, it actually builds community. If you can consistently put out content on a regular and consistent basis, um, you know, you, you actually end up with a, a returning user base. Uh, and, and this kind of fosters brand loyalty before purchase even kicks off. And I think we saw this with the old Spice guy. Like, um, that was the great thing. And that's not even Old Spice being an awesome publisher. That's their agency being an awesome publisher and being really smart. So maybe to go back, it's not that marketers and advertisers should become publishers. I think they need to hire agencies that know how to do publishing unless they, they're big and they want to actually build their own content team. Because you know firsthand, you guys have a lot of people here working on video. Thousands. Uh, thousands. <laughs> There's monkeys everywhere. <laughs> well, I think the reason why this came up was, first off, that you, know, you always look at the, the distribution versus content you know, tug of war, so to speak. And I was thinking about this. And to be fair, one of our Facebook fans made a good comment saying that so long as advertisers buy media based on CPM, cost per thousands of impressions, then it's all about scale. And the only companies that are going to be able to offer that kind of massive scale to advertisers are the aggregators, the distribution sites, because you could just basically, instead of us killing ourselves to produce this great content, you could just basically set up a dashboard and entice people to upload their content, and then you get big numbers, leverage that to advertisers, and then you get the revenues you're in business, voila. So I started off with saying, thinking, yeah, it's true though that if you could basically convince marketers to buy ads, I'm not recommending a black box pricing model, but if you could convince marketers and advertisers that they should maybe get into funding content as a fixed price, and then as a variable price, go for the reach and the display and, and the sort of you know, buying media to, to then promote that, I think that would give content producers quite an advantage. Now there's drawbacks to that, such as that it's, it's expensive to do that. You need a big sales force, it takes a lot of time. But, but then I said, okay, well let's assume you want to get into this content. You know, we're not the first to say this. Jeff Ramsey, who's the CEO of eMarketer, who's in a good position to talk about you know, both forecasts of video and, and advertising and how that, you know, what incentives should be given to marketers to spend more. He, had, um, he published this book earlier this summer um, and he says three things. He says, one, that marketers should be in the content business. Two, he says that marketers, unless I misunderstood, he says that marketers should produce the content, although as an asterisk, it could be that you could still do it by way of an agency or even outsource a company like WatchMojo or whoever to produce that content. Or we in the past have done work for McDonald's and Coca-Cola where we basically just licensed them our videos branded to WatchMojo and they just used them on their site. It was easy, legal didn't get involved. Well, they did, but not as much as if they had to script everything and whatnot. But the third thing that Jeff Ramsey says that I want to focus on and it's, get your thoughts is, he says the content has to be useful. The Old Spice thing was super successful. It, it grew sales by 107%. So the fact that it was funny and entertaining and irreverent actually worked. But I will argue that that's the exception and not the rule. Take a look at Chrysler. Chrysler, which is now owned by Fiat, they, they did two campaigns. One was the whole made, from, made in Detroit, imported right. from Detroit, which actually worked because it stressed that you know, there's quality here, and this is an American-made car, even though that car is actually made in Ontario, but that's a separate point, Canada. Um, but the second thing is then they did something for Fiat around a Jennifer Lopez music video, which people said, what the hell does this have to do with the cars? The dealers were, in, were, were unhappy. Their CEO who now runs, the CEO of Chrysler, who also runs v, uh, marketing for all of Fiat, this French gentleman who's just brilliant, he says, listen, we need to start getting into the dialogue, even if people criticize us for the J-Lo video, at least we're ta being talked about, so I give them some benefit of the doubt. But do you think it's more important to have funny, irreverent, scripted entertainment kind of you know, content or more useful content? That's I, I think the funny, irreverent stuff is, is a much bigger gamble. Of course, with big gambles come greater rewards. The chances though, like if you look at the Old Spice campaign, um, you had a, a, whatever agency did it, I don't remember. Uh, you had a particularly talented team of writers who got lucky with a really good actor, and like there, there was just a lot of chemistry and elements. Um, generally, it's much more cost effective and much more 
clearly tied to your ROI if you actually produce useful content, you know? Um, yeah. I'll give you an example. If you sell fashion accessories and you're constantly putting out content in your blog about like how to accessorize and that kind of thing, you're actually going to bring in the kind of potential users that are that, that could become customers. Yeah, I mean, we've had discussions, for example, with with various companies in that ca in that like category, and like L'Oreal is one where you know we tell them let's look at our video content on fashion and beauty tips, and they're like that's great, but they'll say you know we want to be creating that whether they create it in house or, or a third party or even a production house is, is sort of not the, the the issue here. I would say that. Exactly. It's not so much the success, uh, sort of the determinant of success is not who produces it, if it's branded to the client, if it's branded to a third party, if it's unbranded. I think it's more how do the videos support your objective, right? I personally think if you're like an alcohol company, sure, you, you know, look at MySpace. MySpace back in the day when Rupert Murdoch was like, we want to kill Google, uh, YouTube and all that. They put a lot of money in scripted entertainment. It didn't really make any difference. I will argue, maybe I'm a bit naive, that if you actually have useful content, you're right, it's less sexy, but it's less of a gamble. And over time, it's gonna just, it's easier to market, it's easier to get traction. It's much, it's much, much cheaper to produce because you're actually working from the mindset you already have. Even if you have an agency actually yeah. producing the content, the, the ideas in themselves are coming from you, you know, like, um, a guy who makes deodorant would have never thought, yeah, get a football player yeah. and put him in the shower. Like, well, 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 maybe, maybe, but it depends. <laughs> anyway, let's not even go there. I think a lot of the issues is you get a guy maybe at an agency or in the marketing department that comes up with a nugget, you know, this wisdom, this light bulb goes up, and he throws it out, and they're like, yeah, great, it's irreverent, it's funny, and then it goes up the chain of command to the CMO or the VP of marketing or the CFO or the CEO, and at some point, they're like, why are we spending all this money if this doesn't even have one mention of our brand? And then it gets come back, it comes back down, and then it becomes an ad, and then that's not successful. So I think what was good about the Old Spice was like they managed to make the Old Spice brand and, and sort of product some kind of supporting cast or, or the star, and well, the guy was the star, but, but it wasn't like a big sales pitch, you know? But, but I, again, I think that's the exception and not the rule. But uh, just to go back quickly, one thing I, I did want to say about uh, having useful, like practical content is one, it turns new customers into potential return repeat customers because they keep coming back, consuming the content, finding new ways to use, use and consume your products. And two, it can actually help with new customer acquisition. And this is something I, I tell clients all the time to produce this useful content is at the end of the day, it totally helps your rankings in search. And the great thing about a search user is that they're, they, they're targeted by intention. You know, if you click on an ad on Facebook, that's a huge step because you're on Facebook to socialize. If you're actually searching for tips on how to do something or tips on where to buy something, you're a little bit more engaged. Okay, quick question before we go to lightning round. Do you think that branded content, whether it's useful or irreverent scripted entertainment, do you think that it will really grow considerably and become material? Or is it still going to be all about pre-rolls because it's easy, you take a TV spot, repurpose it, cut it down to 15 seconds and blast it across the web? I think you'll probably see both. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to have companies that are, that are marketing savvy, that have a good CMO in the position that knows how to, you know, keep up with trends. And at the other day, you're going to have guys who are a little bit, you know, negligent. Uh, you've always had good marketing campaigns and bad ones, so I think you'll be able to see, see a bit more of both. And even at the same time, you'll see bad examples of useful content being like, oh, if you really want to accessorize, use our belt rather than use this kind of color. But uh, yeah, I think you're going to see more and more of that useful content coming out. Yeah, I would say that, you know, not to sound Vince Lombardi-esque, but I think people in the advertising and video world are like, why is video not growing a lot more? And, and the tricky thing is that, well, video will only grow if you do the hard things. You know, if you basically just, you know, go for the low-hanging fruit, which is pre-rolls, well, obviously, you're going to get basic small results. Like right. you, you become successful when you do the things that other people don't want to do. You become successful when you do the hard work that others say, that seems like too much work. And I hate to say it, content is that. Producing content, whether it's informational, entertaining, or advertorial, is a lot of work. And I think if marketers... But it builds equity. If you're building your own content, it does build equity. You know, yeah. uh, it's more than showing, shoving in a pre-roll that stops running after the campaign. That content continues to exist somewhere on your site. It continues to bring people in, and it continues to be referred to for years to come. Yep. All right, we're going to take a short break, come back with lightning round right after the break. Mm -hmm.